So Luke chapter 22, and look at verse number 42. Luke 22, verse 42. The Bible says, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The title of the sermon this morning is, Not My Will. I think we get a really great example here of Jesus Christ setting the example for us. And we know that His God manifests in the flesh. Okay? And yet, even as the Son of God, we see a great example here of how God the Father has authority over the Son. And, you know, it's the Son, uh, it's the Son's job, Jesus Christ, to do the will of the Father. And I think we can take these words of Jesus, even though we're not in the position that He was when He said these words, but we can take these words every day of our life and say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. You know, so let's pick it up from verse 31, Luke chapter 22, verse 31. And we know this, you know, last week we, you know, uh, we saw the Last Supper, you know, being done. And this is just now following the Last Supper toward the end as they head to the Mount of Olives to pray. It says here in Luke 22, verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. I love it when when names get said twice. You know, I, I remember Moses, you know, being called twice. Moses. Moses. You know, here obviously Jesus wants Simon Peter to pay attention to what is being said here. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan have desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He's telling Simon Peter, look, Satan wants to destroy you. Satan wants to, uh, you know, discourage you, Simon. Pay attention now. He, verse 32, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. What a beautiful thing to know that Jesus Christ was praying for Simon Peter. Okay? You know, obviously, Jesus, again, setting the example of the Son. He praying to God the Father. Praying that God the Father would strengthen Peter in his time of trial. Okay, let's keep reading verse 33. And he said unto him, this is Simon Peter saying to the Lord, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day uh, before that thou shalt thrice deny me, deny that thou knowest me. So thrice is three times. Okay, twice is twice, two times, thrice is three times. Jesus is telling Simon Peter, look, you're going to deny me. Before the cock crow, before the morning breaks, when you hear that cock crow, you, you would have denied me three times already, Peter. And yet, within a short period of time before that, Peter is saying, look, I'll, I'll go to prison for you. I'll even die for you. You know? And, and I think sometimes we need to understand, look, and, and we, we're not even people that are working with Christ in that day. You know, in the ministry of Christ. And, and we might come to, to think, Lord, you know, we're, we're going to serve you no matter what. I'm always going to stand up for you no matter what is said. You know, I'm never going to deny you, Christ. You know, I'm willing to go to prison for you. I'm willing to die for you. You know, my heart's desire is that same truth of what Peter says. You know, that new man in me, the, 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 you know, the, the spirit, the revived spirit in me, wants those words said. You know, I, I believe in those words. I, I believe that I will do the same for Jesus Christ. Okay? And yet, I'm not an apostle. You know, <laughs> and I'm not seeing the amazing miracles. I'm not seeing Jesus walk on water the way Peter did. I've not walked on water the way Peter had. Okay? And yet, what do we know about Peter? He denies Jesus Christ. And I think this should remind us about how frail we are, you know, how weak we are, that even in times of persecution, we may very well, as Peter, deny the Lord. That's a a reality that we need to be aware of, okay? Yet Peter wasn't. Peter was thinking that he would see it through, thick and thin. Now, Peter normally gets a bad rap. Okay, because we know the story of Peter. We often talk about, man, how, you know, Peter really failed in this area, okay? But I just want to, uh, just keep your finger there and go to Matthew 26. I want to show you something else if you're not aware of this. Matthew 26. So we also have the same story here in the book of Matthew, but there's a lot, of, a little bit more information given here. Matthew 26, verse 31. Because you see, Peter is not the only apostle. He's not the only disciple to say these words. Okay, Matthew 26, verse 31. 
Matthew 26, verse 31. The Bible says, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. All of them. Okay, it's not just Peter. They're all going to get offended. It says here, For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Okay, so who's, who's the, 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 uh, the shepherd? Jesus Christ. Who's the sheep of the shepherd here in this prophecy? The disciples. Okay? But then look at verse 32. It says, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. <laughs> offended. Jesus say, said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, That this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Now look at this. Likewise also said all the disciples. Hey, was it just Peter saying, hey, I'll die for you, I'll go to prison for you? You know, no, they all said, all the disciples said that. But what did Jesus say? That they will all be offended. That when the shepherd, you know, is, um, uh, uh, is, um, is, is smitten, that all the sheep, you know, all the sheep will be scattered abroad. So it's not just Peter. You know, Peter gets this bad rap, but it's all of them. So why is Jesus then focusing on Peter? I think there's two reasons. Number one, because Peter is the loudmouth. You know, definitely. Well, when you when you know about Peter, he speaks before he, he thinks. You know, so he's recorded. But not only that, if you go back to Luke 22, please. Luke chapter 22, verse um, verse 32. You know, Peter had a special role when the sheep would be scattered. You know, verse 32. Jesus said unto him, But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. You see, Jesus was counting on Simon Peter to strengthen the other disciples. They would all deny him. They would all be scattered. They would all be offended. Okay, But he was praying specifically that Peter's fail would not fail him. That he would be converted. That he would change. He would turn around. That he would be strengthened. And then it's he, it was his responsibility to strengthen the other apostles. See, that's why God focuses on Peter. Okay? And what do we take out of that, guys? Is that when our brethren in our church get offended by the name of Christ, when we see our brethren in our church in a backslidden slate, what are we to do? Are we to put them down? Are we to talk behind their backs? Are we to mock their faith? No, just like Peter, hey, we could fall... We could deny Christ. We have the flesh. We could get offended by Christ. But those that are strengthened, those that are, that are showing faith, are to take the fallen brethren and encourage them. The fallen brethren and, and strengthen them. Not, not destroy them. Hey, that's what, that's what the devil wanted to do. The devil wanted to destroy Simon Peter. The devil wanted to destroy the disciples of Christ. Hey, you either play the role of Simon Peter that Jesus prayed for, or you take the role that the devil wanted to do. And that's destroy your, your brothers and sisters in the Lord. All right? Of course, we want to be like Simon Peter. Of course, we ought to be strengthening, strengthening our brethren. Now, I, I do want to cover one false doctrine very quickly. Okay? Just again there in verse 32. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I've heard people say that Simon Peter was not saved. Was not saved. And, t and then, when he gets converted... You know, later, after Jesus Christ is arrested, when he gets converted, that's when he got saved. Okay? And obviously, I understand that the word converted can mean someone getting saved. You know, if someone turns from, you know, it was a Roman Catholic and they get saved, they'll often say, hey, I, I converted to Christianity. Okay? So we know that term can be used. But you know what the word converted means? Think of the word Think of like a convertible, you know, cars that are convertibles. What does that mean? That means their roofs can be converted, right? They can have a roof or the roof can retract and they can have, you know, a, an open setting for their car. All the word converted means, it's similar to the word repent. It just means to change. Okay, it means, means a change. When something's been converted, it's been changed. And obviously, how was Simon changed? Well, he would deny Christ. He would be weak. He'd be offended. But then he would change, he'd be encouraged, he'd be strengthened, his faith would be renewed, and he'd go and strengthen the brethren. That's what would take place. And just for the proof of this, 
Please go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6 verse 63. John chapter 6 verse 63. Because there's many ways to show that Peter was saved. But this is probably one of the clearest ways, one of the best ways. John chapter 6 verse 63. John chapter 6 verse 63. And we read through John chapter 6 last week. Because this is the second uh, Passover that we, we, we looked at. Remember, we're looking at different Passovers in Christ's ministry. That was in John chapter 6, the second Passover, or a, as we get near to it. And we read these words in 63, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Okay, but notice, notice this, verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not. Why is that significant? Because how do we get saved? By believing on Christ. And Jesus says, look, there are some of you that believe not. Look at this. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So who betrayed him? Judas Iscariot. Why? You know, why was he the one? Because Jesus knew he was the one that believed not. Okay? So by what would that mean for the other disciples? That they believed. That they believed on Jesus. Right? Let's keep reading. Verse 65, and he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then so in Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Hey, do you think Simon Peter was trusting in Jesus for eternal life? Absolutely. Verse 69, and we believe and we are sure that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. Hey, who was Jesus to Simon Peter? Was he God the Father? Was he the Holy Spirit? No, he says thou art Christ, the son of the living God. Verse 70, Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. Who is the devil? Judas Iscariot. He spake of Judas Iscariot the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Okay? So this is one clear way for you to know that Simon Peter was saved. Okay? He believed in the Son of God. He knew he was the Messiah. And even Jesus recognizes that he's, he's a believer. Because he says there are some of you that don't believe, referring to Judas Iscariot. Okay? So, you know, this idea, it's like, you know, this thought is, if you deny Christ, if you backslide, if you go back into the world, that proves you were not saved. You know, and, and obviously that false idea plays into thinking Simon Peter got saved after he denied Christ. No, you know what? Even as a believer, I don't care how strong you think you are in the faith, okay? I don't care. You have the ability to deny Christ. You have the ability in your flesh, okay, to say, I never knew him. And we'll see that shortly. If we go back to Luke chapter 22, verse 35. Luke chapter 22. We're going to come back to uh, Matthew chapter... Sorry, John chapter 6 later on. But go to back to Luke 22, verse 35. Luke 22, verse 35. And another important doctrine coming up here, verse 35. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lack ye anything? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, But now, has there been a change? Yes, but now, he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Now, keep your finger there. Go back to Luke 9. I know we've covered this already, but back to Luke 9. Let's refresh our memories. What is Jesus speaking about? This is when Jesus sent out the twelve to go preach the gospel of the kingdom. Okay? But he also gave them power to cast out devils. Luke 9, chapter 1. Luke 9, verse 1. Luke 9, verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together. Look at this. And gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing off for your journey. Neither staves, nor script, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. So here we see Jesus Christ sending his twelve, saying, look, you don't need anything with you. You know, that they would be provided for. 
maybe even supernaturally provided for. In fact, we know that there's supernatural elements of this because not only does he send the 12 apostles, but he gives them power to cast out devils. He gives them power to heal the sick. All right? Why is that important? Because you have the charismatics. You, you have people that believe they can cast out devils today. People that believe they can heal the sick today. That they just have the power of God. Okay? But did Jesus give them that power? Look, when Jesus sends out, sends out the twelve, he gives them that ability. He gives them that power. He appoints them to that office of an apostle. And I'll just quickly read to you from 2 Corinthians 4.12. We've gone from 2 Corinthians before. But remember, um, Paul had to defend his apostleship. And what does he say here? He says, Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Hey, what was the sign of, a, of an apostle? That they would be able to do signs and wonders and mighty deeds. They were able to perform miracles. They were able to cast out devils. They were able to, you know, uh, heal the sick. You know, they were given that power because of Jesus Christ. Now look, if you're not an apostle today, you do not have these powers and abilities. Okay? It's the truth. And, and those that say, well, I can do it, that, therefore I'm a, an apostle. No, you're a false apostle. Okay? Because Jesus did not give you that power. The, the, the time of apostleship is over now. Okay? It, it was there to affirm the words of God. It was there to affirm the gospel. Okay? Today we have the Bible. We have the canonized 66 books of scripture. We have the greater. Because look, who, what brings someone to faith? It's the word of God. We have a greater power. We have a greater uh, ability, you know, uh, of seeing people saved because we have the full word of God at our disposal. Look, I'd rather have the entire Bible in my hands than parts of it, you know, not, or not even the finished New Testament at this point in time, you know, obviously, and, and being able to cast out devils. It's better to know all the wisdom of God that He gives us in the Bible. All right, so that is a false teaching. And look, you say, well, but surely we can, you know, Christians, we can cast out devils today. No. There's been a change. That's why I wanted to look at Luke 22. Remember? He said, but now, he that have a purse, let him take it. Look, if, if you're going to journey and do some soul winning, a missions trip, take your money with you. Okay? You're not going to be provided for supernaturally. All right? You know, and likewise, he stripped, that's a bag with, with your, your possessions. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garments and buy one. Look, you're going to need to defend yourself. All right? You're going to need to defend yourself. Um, so take a sword, you know, with you. And so, obviously, Jesus Christ is given a command, you know, uh, of now and into the future, you know, that um, they weren't going to, going to be necessarily supernaturally provided for. They weren't going to be able to necessarily be able to cast out devils. Obviously, this is, I mean, th they did, because they were apostles. But obviously, this is Jesus Christ speak, thinking of, of us. And, and so, we can recognize the change that took place when he first gave the apostles those powers. Let's keep reading verse number 37. For I say unto you that, and by the way, just don't forget the swords bit, okay? Because this comes into fruition later on. Um, for I say unto you that this, that this, sorry, <laughs> just sometimes the way the Bible is written. Let me read that again. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned amongst the transgression, transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. Okay. So, Jesus Christ is saying, look, there's this prophecy that is written about me that needs to be accomplished, that needs to be done, okay? This is why I'm telling you these things. Now, you guys keep your finger there and go to Mark 15. Go to Mark 15. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you the scripture that Jesus is referring to. Very, it's a very uh, famous chapter in the Bible, Isaiah 53. And I'll just read to you from verse 10. Pay attention as I read this. You guys go to Mark 15. Isaiah 53 verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Now, that's the promise of God 
that Jesus Christ came to bear our iniquities. He came to bear our sins on His body. Verse 12. Now this is, this is the bit. Therefore will I divide Him a portion with the great, and He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because He hath poured out His soul unto death, and He was numbered with the transgressors. Now what Jesus said in the, in, in the book of Luke, He said, was reckoned among the transgressors. But Isaiah says, numbered with the transgressors. The same thing. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Okay? Now, I've asked you to turn to Mark 15 because we don't need to wonder when this prophecy was fulfilled. Okay? The Bible tells us. You know, just flatly tells us there in Mark 15 verse 26. Look at Mark 15 verse 26. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. So obviously, if you guys are familiar with the Bible, this is Christ crucified. They put that note above his head, the superscription, that he's the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled. Hey, was it fulfilled? Absolutely, that's what the Bible tells us. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Okay, so taking, taking you back to Luke 22 there, okay, that he's telling them, look, there's coming a time when I'm going to be crucified, okay, and I'm going to be numbered amongst the transgressors. What, who are the transgressors there? The thief that was on his right hand, uh, you know, they were both thieves, they were both malefactors, right? On his right, left, right hand, and on his left hand. He's telling them, not only is he going to die, but he's going to die with transgressors. He's going to be numbered with the transgressors. And that's the fulfillment there of Isaiah 53. And Jesus Christ prophesies of it as well himself, you know, at the end of the Last Supper here. So let's, let's go back to uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 38. Luke chapter 22. Isn't it beautiful how the Bible is just consistent? You know, Luke, Mark, Isaiah. You know, it's one author. Okay? It's the Lord God. It's not just the writers of men. I mean, look, if you... Brother Jason, Brother Callum, me, myself, we wrote Christ's crucifixion and we were writing about prophecies. We'll mess it up. We'd, we'd mess it up, even though we're living in the same time here. You know, you know not, Isaiah obviously lived many hundreds of years before any of these things took place. That's beautiful how consistent the Bible is. Verse 38, Luke 22, verse 38. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. <laughs> Now, so I think that they're understanding that he's going to be arrested. You know, he's going to suffer. Christ is going to suffer. So, and Christ finished, them, finished off saying, hey, we need, you need to get swords now. And they're like, hey, we have two swords. So you can see that this has gone over the heads. All right. I mean, it's definitely gone over the heads. Jesus Christ, when he's talking about the swords, he's talking about, you know, going on the missions trip, going out, soul winning, make sure you have a defense. And this is why it's important to go two by two. Because if you get into trouble, at least there's someone else there to, to help you out, okay? But, uh, you know, we should, we should defend ourselves. Because, you know, Satan, as a roaring lion, seeks him, you know, who, who, who he may devour. But they're thinking, we've got swords, so we're ready to defend you, Jesus. Okay? And uh, I think the reason they have swords is, remember, they, prepared, they were preparing for the Passover. And it's, it's likely they had the swords there to, to uh, you know, to kill the lamb. You know, the, the Passover lamb. Because they prepare them. I'm assuming that's why they had swords with them. All right? So, let's keep reading verse 39. And as he, as he came out, and by the way, you know, there's 12 men. There's 13 if you include Jesus. Is two swords really enough to fight those that are going to come to arrest Jesus Christ? Of course not. Okay? Jesus says it is enough. It's like, you don't need any more. You don't, you don't need to fight for me right now. Okay? This, this, is, this is part of prophecy. This is going to take place. Verse 39. And he came out and went, and as he went to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when, it was, when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. I mean, I love that. That, that preaches on its own. Okay? Pray that ye enter not into temptation. So we know we're going to go through temptation. We know we're going to go through trials in our lives. And we know when we go through these things, we need to overcome them. Okay, but not only should we should we pray in the midst of temptations, but we should pray to the Lord that we would not be led into temptation as well. Okay, 
You know, because obviously, we don't want to put ourselves in a position where our flesh might win. Okay? And that's what temptation can do to you. You might, you, you know, this is why you sin. This is why you sin every day. Because you're faced with temptations and you allow your flesh to get the better of you. Alright? And of course, you know, this isn't the only time Jesus Christ said this. Obviously, when he, when he gave the model prayer, you know, he said, you know, um, you know, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, so even Jesus Christ in his model prayer prayed that we should not be, you know, pray that we ought not to be led into temptation. Let's keep reading verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Now you might be saying, is Jesus chickening out now? No, he's not. Okay? But he's seeking God the Father and saying, look, is there, is there another way? You know, and, and the cup he's re- referring to is obviously his suffering. What he's about to go through. He's already told the disciples he's going to go through this. Alright? He's not trying to run away from the mission. But we can see here that this is a time of great distress for the Lord. We can see it's a great time of trial for Him. Okay? But does He, you know, does He ask the Father, you know, help me get away from this? No, He says, if there's some other way. Alright? If there's some other way, He's asking, if thou be willing. But then He says, look, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Okay? Christ was, was seeking, is there another way for this to be done? But more important to Christ was that the will of the Father would be done. Hey, this shows us that God, you know, is three persons. And at least we see here, God in two persons. Each of them, the Father and the Son, having their own will. Having their own distinct will. Okay? But even though they have their own distinct will, they're not contradictive wills. Because Jesus Christ makes sure that His will is lined up with the will of the Father. Okay? And guys, this is why I, I named it, you know, our, our sermon, you know, not, not my will, is because we all have our own will separate from the will of God. Okay? And when you sin, and when you walk after your desires and, and your pleasures and the things that are ungodly, the things that are unrighteous, you are saying, my will, God. I want to do my will, not your will. And that's why we need to bring ourselves to a position like Christ, kneeling ourselves in prayer and asking that we will do the will of the Father. Ask God to strengthen us to do His will so we can walk righteously in life, guys. We can't get comfortable in our sins. We can't get comfortable where we're at as, as Christians. Now look, if, if you've matured in Christ, Praise God! If you've grown in knowledge and, and you're walking in faith and, and you can see that, praise God! But you need to continue that journey. You need to continue that, that, that high calling of Jesus Christ that He has in your life. And let me promise you this, you're never going to reach it in this life. You're never going to reach it, okay? Because you're always going to have that old man, you're always going to have that flesh, alright? That doesn't mean we give up. It means we keep striving to walk in the Spirit knowing that the day of Christ is at hand, and when, when that happens, when we're resurrected, and we're given those new resurrected bodies, we know, hey, now, our, you know, in our bodies, we have no desires, and we have no, you know, pleasures in sin, and we can always do the will of the Father. That's a, just an exciting thing to do. But we shouldn't give up, guys. We should keep striving to be more righteous, striving to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came here to give us these examples, Okay? To walk after his steps. And let me just say to the children, what do we learn here, guys? Jesus does the will of his Father. Okay? Now, you guys don't have a lot of responsibilities in your life. You know, you guys may have your chores to do, you know, your, 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 your schoolwork to do, you know, the things your parents ask you to do. All right? And we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of the Father, God the Father. What do we see him doing? Doing the will of the Father. Guys, it's your job, it's your responsibility, children, to do the will of your parents, as long as it's not sinful. Okay? Jesus Christ came and left you that example, children, that when your parents ask you to do something, even if it's not your will, you would say, you know what? 
I'm going to put that aside and do the will of my parents. And guys, that's, that's the best training ground. If you can do the will of your parents, it's the best training ground for you to grow up you know, as mature believers and you will automatically desire to do the will of the Father because you've learned at a young age to do the will of your parents. Okay? So children, very important lesson for you to learn as well. Let's keep reading. Verse 43. And I love, we see how the Father loves the Son. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And it's the same for us. If we seek the will of the Father, okay, we may not see an angel. But I promise you this, if we seek that, God will strengthen us so that we would be able to accomplish His will. Verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, some people have understood this to mean that when Jesus was sweating, he was sweating out blood. Okay? I don't believe that myself. I, I mean, I, when I read that, it says that his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood. But there is a medical condition. Some people give an answer to this. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. It's called hematidrosis. Hematidrosis. You can look this up if you want. Where, you know, in your sweat, when, you, when, you, when, when you're in great anguish and stress, that the capillaries of your sweat glands can break. And so when you sweat, you know, you also sweat out blood. All right? That's one possible explanation to this. I don't really buy into that because I think it's just using it as an illustration that, that there's great drops of blood falling to the ground. Uh, so what, what I think is happening here is just that he's excessively sweating. Okay? So much so that it's falling to the ground. Now, I sweat a lot on the Sunshine Coast. I'm still struggling with humil humility here. Okay? But even when I sweat, my, my clothing is able to absorb the sweat. Okay? You're, you're, you're not seeing sweat falling to the ground. All right? So what we, obviously Jesus Christ is dressed, alright? So what we see here is that he's in so much anguish, knowing what he's going to go through, that even his clothing cannot contain his sweat, that it's literally dropping to the ground, okay? And that's why it's saying great drop, like, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. You know, um, you know, this wasn't easy for Christ to do, okay? But was he trying to back away from it? Absolutely not. He's there to do the will of the Father. All right? I mean, this should just show us just how much he suffered for us. You know, even before, even before being arrested, you know, he's in anguish. He's already suffering. He's, a, he's, already, he's already going through the anguish and suffering before he's even arrested. All right? Um, what a beautiful thing, you know? I mean, it's such a, it's such a horrendous thing to think about what Jesus went through. But it's such a beautiful thing at the same time because it shows the love of God that He loves us so much that He would allow His Son, you know, to go through this. You know, such great torture. And then verse 45, and, and when He rose up from prayer and was come to His disciples, He found them sleeping for sorrow. Now the book of Luke is the only one that really tells us why they fell asleep. When you read the other Gospels, you know, you, you, you probably assume well, they're tired. You know, it's been a long day. And I'm sure that that's part of it. Okay, but the book of Luke actually tells us what exactly caused him to fall asleep. It says he found them sleeping for sorrow. You see, even the disciples were sorrowing. They knew something was going to happen to their Savior. Okay, they knew that he was going to suffer. And they knew Jesus Christ said, you're going to be offended in me. And they're like, how can this be? What's going to happen? You know, they're sorrowing. You know, um, stress and anguish, can, you know, taxes the body. It makes the body tired. You know, it can make you, you know, um, you know, you know, heavily fatigued. So that's part of it. Yes, I'm sure it was a long day. Yes, it was late at night. I'm sure they were tired and sleepy as well. But it was also the sorrow of the disciples that caused them to just collapse and sleep. Their bodies just had enough, you know. Verse 46. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. All right. So once again, Jesus is driving, driving home this. Look, you're about to go through trials, temptations. Pray. Pray now. This, you, need, you need to be strengthened now because you're going to be weak when you go through the temptation. You know, Pray that you'll be able to overcome the temptation. Verse 47. And while he yet spake, behold a multitude. And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, 
went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son, the Son of Man, with a kiss? You see, Jesus did not stand out amongst the disciples. Judas had to come to Jesus, kiss him on the cheek, so the multitudes, these that would come to arrest Jesus, would know who he was. Okay? I mean, another false idea of Jesus is that he was this blonde hair, long haired, blue eyed guy, you know, the most beautiful man ever painted, you know, and then he's got his halo above his head or something. Look, if that was Jesus, they would know who Jesus was. Judas Iscariot had to come and, and kiss him and identify this is Jesus, this is the one that claims to be the Messiah. And I just want to read to you once again from Isaiah 53. It says, "Who have verse 1, Who have believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form, nor comeliness. What does it mean to be comely? It means to be beautiful. Okay? The Bible says that he hath no form, nor comeliness. Hey, Jesus in the flesh, was not beautiful to lay your eyes on. Okay? He was just a regular Jewish looking man. Alright? And then it says, And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Okay? So this, this false idea of Jesus Christ being this beautiful, comely man is false. He looked like any other Jewish man of that time. Let's keep reading verse 49. When they which were about him saw what would follow, and they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? Now, Jesus doesn't even get time to answer this question. Yeah, they have their swords with them, remember. Hey, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Hey, this wasn't the time to fight the sword. Okay? Jesus couldn't even answer the question. And, and we know this is Simon Peter from another gospel. Okay? Here's the one that runs up with his sword and cuts off the ear of a servant of the high priest. Verse 51. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. It's an amazing thing. That even those that hate Jesus, even those that deny him, in, in a sense as these, these high priests had, you know, they're hurt. And yet Jesus, you know, in, in his humility, in his love, in his mercy, heals the servant. Now we see the love of Christ in all of this. You know, he heals the servant. Uh, oh, it's John 18, by the way, if you're curious. John 18, that mentions to Simon Peter that took the sword. Verse 52. But then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders, which were come to him, But ye come out as against a thief, with swords and staves? When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Okay, so it's an interesting thought here. Because you might be asking, what is the power of darkness? What is the power? He says, look, it is your hour. But it is your hour. This is your hour. And the power of darkness. Okay? So we know that it's God's plan and it's Jesus' mission to die on the cross. Okay? And yet now he says, this is the power of darkness. Okay? Now, keep your finger there and go to, let's see, go to uh, Acts chapter 26. I'll get you guys to go to Acts 26. And I'm going to read to you from Ephesians 6 verse 12. Okay? And we know this passage, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Hey, what is the power of darkness here? Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Hey, the power of darkness is spiritual wickedness. Okay? It, it, is, it is the power of Satan, as it were. It's the king of Satan, as it were. I'm going to read to you from Colossians 1.12. It says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which have made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness 
and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Hey, what's the power of darkness? It's the power of Satan. It's the power of spiritual wickedness that prevents many people from coming into the kingdom of God. You know, Satan is busy blinding the hearts and the minds of men that they would not see and understand the gospel and believe the gospel. So that's why it's so important for us, guys, in our jobs, in our missions, to preach the gospel, to remove that darkness with the gospel of light. You know, we're children of light. We're coming here to shine light into this dark place. You guys are in Acts 26, verse 18. Acts 26, verse 18. These are words that Jesus Christ said to, to Paul the Apostle. He says to Paul, he says, this is what you're going to do. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. Hey, how do we get delivered from this power of Satan? This, this power of darkness by faith. It said they're right. Sanctified by faith that is in me. Faith in who? Faith in Christ. Faith in Christ Jesus. And so it, I just want to show you this because it's interesting. Even though it's God's plan for Jesus to suffer and die, Satan was also trying to kill Jesus Christ. Okay? Satan put in the hearts of these scribes and Pharisees and, and religious leaders to kill Christ. It's such an interesting thing because it's almost like Satan thinks he's going to get victory here, you know, only to find, of course, in the, by the resurrection, that it, it, it was God's overall plan. You know, God had it all in control. You know, even when Satan thinks he's winning, he's arrested Christ now, all right, and, and yet it's, it's all under the control of God. You know, Satan can only do as much damage as God will allow him to, you know. So... It's, it's an interesting thing. It's not that Satan is working with God. It's that just even when Satan does his wicked things, God uses it for his good. God uses it for his purposes. Okay? Verse 54. Verse 54. Luke 22, verse 54. And they took him and led him and brought him into a high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them, but a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. Now, I just want you to notice, it is a maid. Normally, the word maid is reserved for, obviously, an unmarried woman, but often a young lady. Okay, This is, this is a young girl. Okay, This is a young girl that says to Peter, This man was also with him. Hey, I've seen this man in Jesus. A young girl, all right? She's not going to hurt Simon Peter, you see? She's not going to overpower him in an arm wrestle, in a fist fight, <laughs> you know? Is she going to bring persecution to Simon Peter? No, she's not, okay? But look at verse 57. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. We see already how weak Peter has gotten. Just by a young girl asking saying to him, Hey, I've seen you, Jesus. You know? You've got a wrong woman. You know? You've got a wrong. I know him not. I don't know him. I don't know what you're talking about. It's not like he was, you know, being, he wasn't arrested. You know, there weren't men around him with swords, anything like this. But we can see already in his weakness, he couldn't stand up to a young girl. He couldn't defend Christ to a young girl. Verse 58. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. <laughs> Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another, confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. Hey, you know, we see another passage, his speech gives him away. Obviously, the Galileans, you could tell they were Galileans by the speech. He goes, Yeah, I've seen this guy. Jesus is a Galilean, just like Jesus, and like all the others. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. So we see what Jesus Christ said of Peter, Simon Peter was true. Look, just hours ago, he was saying to Jesus, I'm going to stand with you, Jesus. I'll go to prison. I'll die for you. 
And yet now, he can't even stand up for the name of Christ. He's so discouraged. He's so brought down. This is why he had to be converted. Okay? This is why Jesus was praying for Simon Peter, that he would be converted, that he'd be faithful and strengthen the other brethren in due time. But I love verse 61 after this. Okay? Because Peter's not under any persecution. He's just thinking, hey, you were Jesus. <laughs> All right? But Jesus is. Jesus is arrested. He's been taken. He knows. He's in anguish. We've seen him, right? And yet when Jesus is brought before the high priest here, we see something amazing. I love it. 61, verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. So we see even while Jesus is facing trial and his death approaches, what's on his mind? Simon Peter. Okay? I mean, I can forgive Jesus for, for thinking just of himself at this point in time. Okay? I, I can understand if Jesus were that way. But instead, he turns and looks at Simon Peter. Even in the face of difficulties and trials and anguish, you know, in the torture to come, still he's thinking about Simon Peter. Still he's thinking about how he's going to, to fail. How he's going to deny Christ. Still thinking about him. I'm sure. Still praying for him. Okay? And, and this should remind us, guys, when we're facing problems, when we deny Christ, when we're backslidden, when we think God wants nothing to do with us, we're still on the mind of God. God can still look at us, turn around and look at us. He's still thinking about His his child. He's still thinking about his children. That should encourage us, guys, in the face of trials. Even in a backslidden slate. You know, God is thinking about us. Okay? He doesn't forget us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. You know, God, He abide faithful, even when we're not when we're not faithful. Alright? I love it. And Peter gets out there, weeps bitterly. Okay? If you think crying is not a manly thing, sometimes it is. Okay? Sometimes we do need to cry and, and, and weep. Okay? And he, Peter had to do that to regain, to just get all that emotion out of him, regain his composure, and become faithful once again. There's nothing wrong with, with crying, man. Okay? Maybe you don't want your wife and your kids to see you. Then do what Peter did. He went out. <laughs> he went out. He went somewhere alone and wept bitterly. Verse 63. And the man that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. So, you know, a lot of people think about the cross as the suffering. And of course it is, but even prior, you know, they're, they're, they're mocking him. They're smoking him. They're beating him up. Okay? And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? They're just mocking him. And many other things blasphemed, blasphemously spake they against him. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, ye will not believe. So they're asking the question, Are you the Christ? Now, Jesus doesn't say to them in these words, Yes, I am. Yes, I am the Christ. But in a roundabout way, he does say he is the Christ. Okay, in a roundabout way. Why? Because it says, if I said unto, um, sorry, and he said unto them, I tell you, if I, if I tell you, you will not believe. Now look, if he said, I am not the Christ, would they believe that? Yes. They don't believe he's the Christ. Okay, they would believe that. So if he says, if I tell you, you will not believe, what is he saying in a roundabout way? That he is the Christ. I am the Christ. If I told you I'm the Christ, you would not believe anyway. Okay? They weren't interested in the truth. They weren't asking Jesus. They weren't giving him the benefit of the doubt. They weren't trying to give him a fair trial. They weren't trying to allow him to defend himself. They were just asking questions to find accusation against them. Okay? And I've already covered this, but be careful about the questions you answer. Okay? You may take the approach, if I tell you, you will not believe. Okay? Sometimes they're just trying to find fault in your words. And verse... 68. 
and it says, and if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. It says, look, you're not interested in letting me go. You're not interested in even answering my questions. Why are we having this discussion? You know, Jesus knows they've arrested him to kill him. Jesus knows that, okay? And it doesn't matter what happens, what gets said, that's, what they, that's how they're going to position this trial to end up being, okay? Verse 69 yeah, uh, just another beautiful words of Jesus here. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. <laughs> so he doesn't, again, doesn't tell him as many words that he's the Messiah, but he says, look, hereafter, soon afterwards, I'll be sitting at the right hand of the power of God. You know, what, what, who else but the Messiah could, you know, the Christ could, you know, could be sitting there at the right hand of God? Who else but the Son of God? And verse 7, they, they realize this. Then said they all, Are thou then the Son of God? You know, th- th- they recognize, okay, well, the only one that could sit at the right hand of the, fa- of the Son of the Father would be the Son. Are you the Son of God then? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. You know, uh, affirming what they had said about him. That they're saying, Hey, this guy says he is the Son of God. Okay? And he's saying, You said it. Okay? So he's not saying in as many words, I am the Son of God, but once again, in a roundabout way, you know, he's saying, yep, you said, I am the Son of God. And he's, he's affirming that, okay? Verse 71, And they said, What need we any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. So they recognize. Out of his own mouth, he's admitting, because he's not denying it, he's admitting that he's the Messiah, he's the Christ, that he's the Son of God. They acknowledged that he had affirmed these questions, and we're not denying them. So that brings us to the end of the chapter, guys. So, just a few things I want you to understand. And just again, the title, Not My Will. Okay, guys? And look, when you're in a backsliding state, like Peter was, do you think he was seeking the will of God? No. He was doing his own will. Okay? His will was weak. What does the Bible say? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay? Now, again, in our spirits, in our new man, I'm sure we all say, Lord, I will stand for you. Lord, I will always be in church. Lord, I will always be soul winning. Lord, I will always be reading my Bible. Lord, I will always be strengthening the brethren. That's what I'll be doing for you, Lord, for the rest of my life. Okay? But the reality is, unless you're better than Peter, unless you're better than all these apostles, you are going to go through these times. You are going to go through times in your life when you're like, is it really worth it? Is it really worth proclaiming the name of Christ? Is it really worth being in church? Is it really worth strengthening and edifying the brethren? You know, you're going to come to a point. It's going to happen, guys. Okay? And, and, and what's the instruction that Jesus gives us? To pray that we would not be, you know, led into temptation. We need to be praying. This is going to keep us humble. If we recognize we have the ability to fall. We have the ability to fail. We have the ability to sin. We have the ability to not do the, the will of the Father. That's what's going to get you down on your knees and praying and say, God, this is what I want. I don't want to deny you, Lord. Please strengthen me. Please help me not to get into this place of temptation where the flesh can get in the way. All right? We should be doing that. Okay? Don't think yourself high, more highly than what you are. Okay? But when you do fail, when you do fail, you are on the mind of God. God has not forgotten you. God is still faithful to you. God is still seeking that you would come to Him. Okay? And you may need to weep bitterly to get yourself back right. Okay? And if that's what you've done, hey, you're not a failure. Okay? Because Christ prayed that the faith of, of, of Peter would not fail. Okay? Just because you backslide doesn't mean you failed. You only fail if you stay backslidden. Okay? You don't fail if you get out of that state, you get strengthened, you weep bitterly, you go to the Lord, you confess your sins, you know, you seek His will for your life, He'll strengthen you. Okay? Just like the angels strengthen the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, God will strengthen you in your times of trial. God will strengthen you in order for you to do His will. Okay? So please remember these things as we go toward the end now um, to the crucifixion of Christ and His resurrection. You know, we can learn so many truths. You know, we can put ourselves in, in, in the shoes of these apostles and be like, man, if better men than us can fail, then surely we can. We need to be alert, we need to be aware, we need to be humble. You know, if you fill yourself with pride, you lift yourself up, 
Guaranteed, you're going to fail. Guaranteed, you're going to fall. Let's pray.